I want to thank you for inviting me to talk about a really important problem that I've been worried about more and more for the last 10 years, which has to do with climate change. There's a lot of crazy debate about climate change. A lot of people who form opinions but there's some hard questions which even the experts do not always ask. And so what I want to do today is talk about the journey I've been on, starting from studying the basic facts to trying to answer the really hard question. It is, will Euxinia kill all humans? How bad could climate change possibly be? I'm not talking about whose fault it is. Are humans to blame or not? That's not the issue. The issue is, are we going to live or are we going to die? There's a lot of hyperbole about climate change. There are people who make it sound as if 10 feet of sea level is going to kill everybody. Of course it isn't. And when we get strong emotions about that, that's a distraction. But after years of studying this question, I've come to the conclusion that there are serious worst case possibilities in climate change that really could possibly kill us all and we might be able to affect the probability that it happens. But what I'm really worried about is the danger that a gas called H2S could be emitted from the ocean in quantities so large that it really would kill us all. And there's more and more evidence out there that this is a real possibility. We don't know how soon. I think I know more about this risk than anyone else on Earth right now, which is very sad. We should know more. For 30 years, I worked at the National Science Foundation as a research program director. I learned the importance of asking hard questions in science and technology development for th almost 30 years, supporting research and engineering. And I was a leader in artificial intelligence and then ran the electric power research for a while. At some point they said we need help with climate change. In the year 2009, I was assigned for a year on rotation to work with the Senate. I worked for a Senator Specter who had the balance of power in the Senate in those days. And I was asked to work for him with the environment the EPW committee of the Senate assigned to study climate change. So I got to see what the real issues were. I pretty much by the end of the year knew everything that the people on that committee did about climate change. But it turns out there were some things they didn't know. And it took me 10 years to fill in the holes of the information that never quite made it. Now I should say we started the year as a Republican <laughs> and ended as a Democrat. So for the first part of the year I got to really see what the climate change skeptics were saying. I got to study their arguments in detail. I paid real attention to them. If I could have agreed with them, I would have, to be honest. We had a powerful incentive to work with the other Republicans. And there was maybe two days I thought I could agree with them, but I wanted to check. And after I checked, didn't quite hold up. And so when I came back from the Senate to the NSF, I asked them, are you guys going to do research on this question? The real life and death issues never really made it to the research agenda. And so my first thing is we need to study these questions better. I should not be the world's expert on this question. We need more people to focus on this question more directly. In the start of 2009, I did not believe climate change was very important. I knew it was real, but I read these international reports and they were saying we expect the world GNP to drop by only 5% over the next century. This was from the IPCC Standard International Report. And I looked at that and I said, 5% of the world's GNP? That's not the most important issue. National security, energy security, the Middle East, these are much bigger issues than 5%. And I didn't really realize back then how important it was. And we agreed there should be some pollution fee for people who pollute because it has a cost but our position in Spectre's office was the fee should not be exorbitant the cost per ton of CO2 it should just reflect the cost no more no less we shouldn't make a big deal of it we should focus on bigger issues and the Republicans they said you climate change people 
you're making such a big deal of the CO2 in the atmosphere. You're saying if it gets to 500 parts per million CO2, all kind of bad things will happen. And the skeptic said, I've got news for you. <laughs> history. <laughs> that most of the history of life on this earth, the last billion years, in most of it, the CO2 was 2,000 parts per million. And life went on as usual. So why are you so worried about 500 parts per million? And I wondered, okay, if life just went on as usual, how big could the risk really be? And I didn't think it was all that big. And nobody in the room knew the real answer. How bad could it be? But then I got some further information. And this was a big transformative moment in my life. I went back to NSF to hear a public lecture, and it wasn't about climate. It was a big lecture about what do we know about the real history of life on Earth. What happened to life in that billion years we were talking about? The head of the Geosciences Directorate of NSF introduced a big public talk, and he said, this guy I'm introducing you, Peter Ward, is the number one frontline expert in the world on what really caused the mass extinctions of life in the past history of the Earth. He's one of these guys who went out there and chopped at the cliffs to find out the strata, look at the biomarkers, find out what was happening in the past history of the Earth. He was a frontline empirical guy. He explained what caused the greatest sources of death. And then just at the end of the talk as a throwaway, he said, oh, by the way, I look at the numbers of all these extinctions. I looked at what was happening on Earth when there was mass death. And when I look at the numbers we have now, they look very familiar. There are changes going on. He said, I don't know how this physics works, but my gut feeling is if the CO2 gets to a thousand parts per million, probably we will have a rerun of the mass death we did see before on the Earth. Life did not just go on as usual in the past. There really was mass death in the past. And his gut feeling was, thousand parts per million, we'll all die. I was shocked by what he said, but I was even more shocked by the rest of the audience, to be honest. Half the people in this big public talk said, Oh, this is all climate stuff. All climate stuff is false. I said, but wait a minute. This is real history. But the other half, their response was, this shows I'm a good person. I support climate legislation, and I care about climate, and what his talk shows me is that I'm a good person. And I'll just continue to be a good person. And I asked myself, Am I the only one in this whole room who comes out asking, are we going to live or are we going to die? Is this real? Is it not? Is it going to happen? And so while all these people were looking in the mirror, I was asking, is it real or isn't it? I don't know. I want to know. Does anybody else care whether we're all going to live or die? That was my response. And even though I got a PhD and all that, I'm still a human. I care. Are we going to live or are we going to die? That was the important issue for me. The first thing I did after that talk was to go out and buy the book. One of the good things about this book is it had an annotated bibliography. In other words, he didn't just tell you his theories. He also had a literature survey and he described what the different papers tell you. And that was important because he's not a chemist or a, uh, a physicist but he could cite papers of people who are. And when I wanted to find out, do I believe this or don't I, I went to some of those papers. I studied the details. I didn't just take his theories for granted. This is a graph of the history of life on Earth, basically. <laughs> it shows you the CO2 levels. This could have come from Al Gore almost, what the CO2 levels are. But superimposed on that, he showed you when there was mass death. The mass death was connected to Two variables, the poison gas, H2S, getting into the atmosphere, and radiation, which probably came from ozone layer depletion connected to the gas. So the gas did two things. It would kill you directly, and it would destroy the ozone layer. Probably the ozone layer is what killed you first. And for some of you who wonder, wait, what is H2S and is it so bad? You have actually smelled H2S, and it didn't kill you. If you've ever smelled rotten eggs or you've been to a really stinky marsh, 
you would know you've smelled H2S. But the thing is, that's a low concentration. And that's this funny thing about this gas, H2S. At the same concentrations, H2S is a stronger poison than hydrogen cyanide. We all know hydrogen cyanide is bad. H2S is a stronger poison at the same concentration. But even a low concentration triggers us. <laughs> and I think this has to do with our biology. Over a few million years, if this gas has killed people, it's understandable we have evolved an ability to smell it and run away. But at high concentrations, we know it kills. It's really bad. And five to ten times in the past history of the Earth, we know that H2S and radiation were at levels high enough to kill every human on Earth. Five to ten times. So life didn't just go on as usual. That's not a true history. The history is five to ten times the H2S and the radiation got high enough that they could kill every human on Earth. And the question is, is it going to happen? What is the probability? What drives it? How soon? Dotted red lines are the times of mass death, and the chart is the CO2 concentration. And what Peter Ward pointed out was, gee, the CO2 rises, and that's when you get the mass death. What causes the death is not CO2, it's the H2S. But somehow or other, when the CO2 was rising, when it was rising rapidly, those were the times when the mass death happened. Um, and so what is the connection? What really causes this H2S? That's the real question. What caused the H2S to spike? Does that apply today the way it did in the past? 